Hey everyone and welcome back to the Firefighters Podcast where we seek to develop, inspire and motivate the world of the emergency services operator through a series of wide ranging conversations. Now before we go any further, just hit that rate, follow or subscribe button on whatever platform you're listening to. It's a key performance indicator for us and helps us reach even more people. Now here's what we've got for you today. your less experienced self some advice about what would that be yeah great question so so two things first thing I would say is being different is bloody fantastic and secondly when you get told something's impossible reframe that word because actually it spells I'm possible um, for me it would kind of be quite simple and that's be yourself just be authentic just just be you I think sometimes you just got to throw yourself at it and know that you might fail, but just go for it. Um, and I think I'd like to tell myself it'll work out in the end. Oh God, I wish I'd told myself some of this stuff earlier. <laughs> uh, so two things. The first one is, do not hide your light under a bushel. You don't have to apologise for being you and you should not be less brilliant. So if you've got that light, don't stick it under something, stick it in a candlestick. Right, and light the way for other people. The second thing I would say is, you know, when we're starting out on our careers, whoever we are, whatever um, genre or sector we're working in, we will always have an opportunity to be kind and to help other people. And pay it forward is a really important strategy to live by. So do others a favour because actually they will pay it forward and it will make for a better working environment. I think the main thing is don't, don't waste energy trying to please other people um, because you're just wasting a lot of time trying to please other people and really you should be trying to please yourself and be yourself, be who you want to be. Um, you know, the fire service is a far richer place for all the unique people in this room, whoever you are and whatever you are. So, you know, be yourselves and don't sit there waiting until you're good enough because you'll always be waiting for something else. And anybody that knows me, put your big girl pants on and do it anyway. Um, so that's what I say, thank you. Um, I suppose for me, um, genuinely coming from a background of having no desire whatsoever to go for promotion, um, the fact that, you know, I echo the sentiments, you will never be ready. Do not ever think I'm going to be ready and now is the perfect time because you're going to be waiting a long time because we're not ready and we're all going to make mistakes. And what I would say is be proud of your mistakes, own up to them, share them with people, be honest, because people will like you far better for being a human being, being an honest and decent human being, and being a kind, honest and decent human being. And I think that's one thing I've tried to be forever, was to be myself and be kind, because it costs nothing to be kind, but what you don't always appreciate is how much difference you can make to somebody's day just by being decent and by being kind. And do that consistently throughout your career, and it will take you a long way. But don't ever look and wait for that moment that you're going to step into and think now's the moment, now's the perfect moment. Because it never is, it's always uncomfortable, it's always scary. But do you know what? We are brilliant people and we can achieve brilliant things. So sometimes just go for it. And if you fall, get up and learn the lesson, dust yourself off and give it another go. Because we're all designed to make mistakes and learn from them. Um, but we learn the most from our mistakes. and actually from sharing those mistakes and not allowing other people to do them and helping other people on the way. Okay, on to the next question. Um, and this is from Jane Lingard from West York. So, thank you, Jane. What advice would you give, any, give to anyone aspiring to be a principal officer? So, uh, I'm probably not the best person to ask. <laughs> because it didn't go quite as well as I would like it to have gone, especially at the end. But, do you know, if you want to do it, then believe you can do it. Do it being yourself. Do not be somebody else. Be your true self. Go for promotion. And my view was, I went for it being myself and being honest. And if they didn't give me the job, then I couldn't be myself in that job and I wouldn't have wanted it. So that would be, you know, a principal officer is a great job. It comes with a lot of responsibility, it comes with some scary bits, it comes with some rubbish bits. 
but it also comes with some massive privilege and some massive you know moments where you can be hugely proud so if you want to do it go for it be the best you can be but be yourself while you're doing it so dawn what obstacles have you had to overcome progressing in the fire service as a female <laughs> maybe just summarize <laughs> So, <laughs> have you read my book? No. <laughs> uh, so, uh, this year is my 18th year um, in the Fire and Rescue Service, and before that, um, I was a manager, commercial manager in the private sector, and I've also run two charities. Um, what I would say about uh, obstacles is, if you see something as an obstacle, it is. So, uh, reframe, barriers are things that are challenges to push away. What I would say is that um, I started, uh, and for those of you that don't know, uh, I started as a direct entrant um, quite a lot of years ago, and it wasn't particularly popular then, and I'm not sure if it is now, to be frank with you. But at the end of the day, I had to come in to what was extensively 18 years ago, uh, obviously a male service, uh, and also one that hadn't really done um, much in terms of alternative leadership pathways. But I knew that I had a, frankly, a bloody good commercial background, uh, a very strong background in terms of training and leadership with the John Lewis Partnership. And for me, it was about seeing those genuinely, and I know this sounds a bit trite, but seeing obstacles as opportunities because otherwise I wouldn't have joined the Fire and Rescue Service. The other thing I would just say is um, be prepared, be realistic. There's stuff that's going to come your way when you take on a job like this, whether it's financial, political, you know, industrial relations, shite, or other sort of things that is going to happen. <laughs> and, and to be honest, just get prepared, be real with it, talk to people, listen to other people. I've got some fantastic colleagues up here. Um, and they have helped me in my journey in the Fire and Rescue Service and helped turn those barriers into things you can just snip with a sharp pair of scissors. A quick reminder for all of our listeners of our monthly giveaway. Now, as part of our partnership with Hikes, Rosenbauer, and Tallyman, we give away that little bit extra to our podcast listeners every single month. You can get two personalized BA tallies. These are hard wearing. They've got your own name on them, they've got your own service number on them, and they have the podcast logo on the back. And then for the juicy stuff, Hikes give away a pair of their incredible footwear. And some of the stuff is pretty expensive stuff, to be honest with you. We try and switch in and change it every month. We are guided by the gods of Hikes to make sure we are giving you exactly what you need for that time of year. So it might be boots, it might be trainers and then once every quarter our good friends over at Rosenbauer are giving away their Boris B5 Firefine boots as well so to be in with a chance to win jump over to our social media platforms or YouTube where you need to tag a member of the emergency services in the post be following our page and you will be in with a chance to win at the end of every single month back to the show have you ever had imposter syndrome as you've gone through promotion any tips on how to deal with it yeah I think everybody does I even said tonight, I'm going to be up there with real chiefs. <laughs> so, um, I, I think everybody does. And when you go to that you know, interview, that assessment centre, um, and you're looking at all the other candidates, and they look so much better prepared than you are, and they're thinking exactly the same thing. Um, and you have to realise that, um, that you, know, you can't see what's going on inside their head and they might look absolutely perfect, but they're not, they're just like you are. Um, and you just give it your best shot, and if it's meant to be, it's meant to be. Um, so yeah, I think, I, I don't suppose there's one person in this room would say they haven't encountered imposter syndrome. And if you haven't, like, put your arm up now. <laughs> uh, yeah, because it, it is, it's just part of um, promoting and, and moving on in any organisation. What's the funniest mistake you've ever made and how did you dig yourself out of the mess you created? I wouldn't necessarily say it was a mistake but um, it, was, it was quite funny um, and um, so there was like we had a bit of a job going on in, um, in St Ives and um, uh, there was um, there was a, a, a bit of a gas leak and that was kind of um, accelerating the fire 
So um, I turned around to the incident command at the time, so I didn't just come on the scene. I said, look, we need to get the, need to get the gas isolated. And he's like, oh, right, yeah, okay, I'll get that done for you, boss. It wasn't at all brilliant. So went around, did a bit of like situational awareness. <laughs> um, thought to myself, oh, goodness me, going to be here for a while, aren't we? Um, had a little bit of a look around, came back. Gas leak was still, it was, like, it was still going. It was like literally like a jet going through the roof. Um, and uh, for those of you that know St. Ives, it's got a common roof void. If one goes, they all go. It's really quite difficult. Pasties go, fish and chips, potty <laughs> cream, it's dreadful. Um, and I said to him, can you not get the gas turned off? <coughs> well, I can't really, because the gas people are drinking, so worried about the roof tiles coming off. So I was like, oh, okay, fine. That's, that's, that's fine. I'll just crack in, sort out the gas leak, it'll be fine. Or it'd be like £6 million to dig up the road. I don't want them to dig up the road, I just want to go in, turn off the gas, job done. So um, I popped around the corner, and the gas company was there. And I was like, oh, all right. And it's like, yeah. It's like, oh, could you go and turn the gas off? I don't know, it's like, oh, difficult. So I'll tell you what, I'll whip round, I'll get you a pot noodle, and uh, we've got a really great welfare wagon, by the way. <laughs> I'll whip over, I'll get you a bad boy pot noodle and a cup of tea, can you turn the gas off? All right, we'll do that. Whip round, got pot noodle and a couple of bad boys, kind of like, uh, gave them, oh, thanks so much, great. Went back to the incident command unit, and uh, the, the, the kind of the incident commander at the time went, how on earth did you manage that? <laughs> and I said, it's just about establishing a relationship, having a conversation. <laughs> kind of having a conversation about risk. <laughs> a conversation about consequence. Coming out with joint situational awareness and an action plan. Thank you very much. If you could go back in time and change one thing throughout your career, what would it be and why? Just one thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, did I or didn't I move off a fire station quick enough? So I joined a watch at Dunstable and I was on the watch uh, back in the days when you had to do probationary and qualified exams. So generally, you'd wait until maybe about six to eight years before you'd move into another area of the business and uh, I moved into training centre after about seven years and actually that was the biggest stretch that I had moving into a different environment. I think after about three to four years my brain wasn't really being stretched enough and you know what they say about idle hands. So I think it's about timing and stretch so for me I think I would have potentially aimed to move slightly quicker into training school. I wouldn't have had the motorbike accident that caused the duty officer, who happened to be the training centre manager, come out to the hospital, who then didn't know how to deal with welfare, and so his first question was, when are you going to come work for me in training school? Uh, I wouldn't have had that happen, but yeah, I think it's that. It's about knowing when is the time to move, and understanding that sometimes being comfortable in a place is not always what's going to stretch or challenge you to the most. So I'm going to ask all of our chiefs that question. I think I'd have been a lot firmer with my first watch when I became a leading firefighter. <laughs> um, and that's probably where I, um, a couple of things that happened the first time, you kind of, you do want people to like you. Um, and, um, and you could do that by being yourself. Um, but I probably tried that a little bit too hard. Um, I knew I'd kind of not been stitched up at all, but um, there were not a lot of people that would have probably accepted the watch that, that I got offered as a temporary promotion. Um, but as Dawn said, you've got to take everything as an opportunity. Um, and I probably, I look back now and think, um, I wish I'd gone in there as probably myself and gone in there and, and just, if I'd gone back now, I would have done that differently, absolutely. And the pivotal moment for me, and this is when I, um, I had been on the watch for probably about three or four months, and we'd gone to an incident, and it was something as simple as, um, just, it was a house, it was a kitchen fire, got out, and um, you know, I did like a little thing, oh, this is what we need, and this is kind of what we want, moderate thing of a SMEAC kind, of, um, uh, kind of briefing. And I just remember turning around and they were going to take a dry powder into the kind of kitchen 
for a grill pad fire. And I was like, I just like, like, I found my voice, shouted like, rest! <laughs> just, what are you doing? Dry powder bulbs. No, like, literally, CO2. In they went, came out, we debriefed after, and I went like, these people want a kitchen after the end of this. Do you know what I mean? It's only a grill pad fire, goodness sake. And uh, they said, oh, you good call, boss, good call. But I wish, you know, I kind of, from then on, um, I was in charge. You know, I got my voice and um, I was making the calls. And I think if I could have gone back, I would have replayed that. I would have gone in there with my grill pan fire and my dry powder versus a CO2. I would have gone in with that attitude of, I'm in charge, this is my, this is me. You know, and, and, and own that me. I think I should have learned to challenge sooner um, and I think it's really important that whoever you're working with, whatever, however clever they might seem, um, if they're doing the wrong thing, you challenge. Um, and um, rather a, a ridiculous example was, uh, I think, I was coming, I came down to the fire service college um, with the chief, I was working uh, with at the time, um, and he leapt in the car, um, having just come back from France, and decided to drive on the wrong side of the road. And I'm sitting in the car next to him thinking, should I tell him? Would it be rude if I tell him? Perhaps I should, in the end I screamed at him to tell him. <laughs> so, yeah, we'll find your voice. How have you managed with childcare while you progressed through your career? So when I had my daughter, I um, just got flexi station manager. Um, so it was an absolute nightmare because my husband went to work for half six in the morning uh, and when I was on call overnight. Um, so I managed it through paying the nursery extra to open early. And I would go and sit with my daughter at the nursery Till they officially opened and if I got a fire call they'd look after us um, and my mother-in-law used to finish work earlier so she would pick her up from nursery um, and when I came down here when she was eight months old um, they offered to open one of the houses up for me but it wasn't possible in the end um, so I had to be away from her for three weeks apart from the weekends um, so it was crap, and the, it really and it was expensive. Um, so it was really difficult. And just I think it was Dawn said about you know spending time. And one of the things about retirement is I've committed to spending a bit more time with my daughter, particularly while she's doing her studies, because I've not been there ever so much. Um, so it's important, but really difficult. And I said to Kaz on the way down, I'm going to open the nursery now. I'm retired for emergency services workers who work shifts and can't get the cover. <laughs> So uh, I have been asked this a lot uh, in my career, both in my services and from, from colleagues uh, from around the sector actually, um, partly because they knew when I was promoted that I'd got a lot of them. Um, and some of them are by birth and some of them are acquired through, uh, you know, through other relationships, shall we say. Um, so I've got stepkids and I've got, yeah, ones I birthed. And, um, and how did we manage it? A bit like Alex, really, it was really hard. And um, I, I worked for John Lewis's department stores for a lot of years, and that was the same sort of hour pattern. So I was working every weekend. There were no weekends off at all, especially when Sunday trading came in. Um, and so I had a combination of nursery, which was really expensive. And then um, we were... We had no family near us at all. Uh, uh, my parents' farm in South Wales and my, uh, my husband's were, were away in another part of the country as well. So we kind of had to beg, borrow, steal, plea, rely on friends a little bit, abandon, yeah, did a bit of abandoning. Um, and, and also, I, um, I, found a mo I found a fantastic lady called Buxana, um, who was a Hindu uh, lady and who did the charmanding on a Saturday for me in Milk Keynes, actually. 
and uh, Roxana exposed our three youngest to a different culture. Uh, they went to weddings with her family on a Saturday. They ate all sorts of stuff. I had some nappies after those parties. <laughs> uh, but it was fantastic because, you know, I started out with a guilt complex the size of you don't know what. Um, and then, as I reflect back, it's easy to reflect back and think it was all alright, wasn't it? But the, some of the opportunities the kids got were great. But I felt guilt and I felt um, loss. And, you know, I know uh, that Dad went to some of the stuff and missed out some of the stuff. And, you know, when you're watching your kid's first Christmas concert on a video that's been filmed and you've had to persuade one of your mates to film it because you can't be there, that's pants. Um, so, hence my earlier comment. But what I would say about my kids, because I can, the youngest is now 23, yeah, go look, yeah. <laughs> L'Oreal face cream. Um, and my uh, youngest son uh, is at Sandhurst, he's in the military. Uh, uh, one of our daughters is a lawyer, another's a psychologist. Uh, one is a critical care paramedic, and the other's an IT consultant. I'm immensely proud of them. What they learned from me and their dad was work ethic. Graft, work hard, make sacrifices, and, you know, at the end of the day, they did have opportunities that some other kids didn't have. But I will never lose the sense of loss I had. Hence my earlier comment. Give yourself, and, and if your managers aren't giving you that freedom, go and demand it. We have three uh, daughters. And uh, in the early days, it was just spending fortune on Charminder. Um, and then when I moved to North Wales, um, the family stayed up in Cumbria. Um, and so I camped out during the week and used to drive the three and a half hours back up to Cumbria um, at the, the weekends. Um, I couldn't have done it if my husband hadn't given up his career to bring up our daughters. So, you know, we, have, we completely flipped traditional roles and I say I would never have been able to do it without him. If you can talk to us a little bit about some of the failures you've experienced and, and more importantly, how you dealt with them. Don't ever think of anything as a failure. Um, you know, genuinely, it feels like a kick in the guts at the time, but it, you have to kind of look at it as a, a learning experience. Um, and what I will share with you is um, there was only actually one promotion that I've, uh, that I've had, and that includes getting into the fire service, where somebody has, a, to my face, said to me, well, you've only got that because you're a woman. And I would also say my most recent promotion to chief um, was not that particular promotion. So what I would say is, is, is what I've heard, or what would I say, you know, what, what can you learn from this or what have I learned from it? It's, um, it's the fact that you're the person that it kind of matters to. It genuinely doesn't matter to anybody else. You've really got to go for something and like we've already said, you will never ever think that the time is right. Go for it. Go into that as prepared as you can be. What I would say is, is you've got a whole room full of people here today that will help you prepare for these opportunities. And the one thing that I would say is, is in, um, when I first came here, I was a temporary station manager. And I did come here thinking, what on earth could I come to WFS for? You know, what can I give to WFS? And um, seven years later, I became chief fire officer. And what I would say is my promotions that I've had since coming here, yes, I've gone for those promotions with my learning, with um, my preparation, knowing that it's something that I wanted to do. But I've gone, especially for my Chiefs promotion, going, do you know what? I've got every single woman in the fire and rescue service sat on my shoulder cheering for me take that away from this weekend. And I 
also had Alex and Daddy going, you better bloody get it. <laughs> What's the worst piece of advice you've ever been given at work? I think the worst piece of advice I was ever given was, if you behave like everybody else, you'll do all right. <laughs> and that's just yeah. crap. Because what that means is you conform and you become the same as that person over there rather than bringing what makes you unique into the workplace. So, yeah, absolutely. What a rubbish bit of advice that was. And it took me probably four or five years to realise it was rubbish advice because actually it was much more comfortable being the same as all those people over there. It was much easier not to put your head above the parapet and be the one that was saying, hmm, maybe we shouldn't do it like that. Maybe we should have fire kit that fits women. It was much easier not to say that because you just got a load of stuff thrown at you. So that, I think that would be it. What's your favourite quote? I suppose my favourite one is put your big girl or boy pants on. Um, but if you can see it, you can be it. And, you know, I look around the room and, you know, we used to be so many tables back. And now, you know, we're almost in the Twin Towers room and we've got a waiting list of people. And I think that's because people are starting to see that they can be it. Um, and that makes me really proud. So if you can see it, you can be it. So uh, mine would be, if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. So we have to make change. We can't just stay on a treadmill of the same thing over and over again, thinking it's going to fix all the challenges that we've got. So we have to be brave and we have to be bold and do stuff differently. Do you have a motto for life? For me, what, what's kind of made me probably as um, the person I am is really feeling, feeling able to express my soul um, and able to be myself, to be excited. Don't waste tomorrow for your expectations of, of yesterday. So just make today count. Short and brief, my one is just be kind. We've all got the opportunity to be kind to each other and it doesn't cost us anything. So take time and be kind. Thanks for coming back and listening to the Firefighters Podcast. This one was brought to you by William Wood Watches. William Wood Watches, as I'm sure you're already aware, are the makers of those incredibly authentic watches with a piece of firefighting history in every single one. On the 9th of June, they created 250 beautiful limited edition pieces of the bravest watch for the FDNY Foundation. They're donating 15% from every single watch to the FDNY Foundation. And it's pretty incredible to see that William Wood Watches are now in the Rockefeller Center, the FDNY Fire Zone store that's held within Rockefeller Center on the 9th of June they will be having one of their watches which is going to press William Wood Watches into the history of FDNY. Johnny and the team are over there kicking ass and taking names. Be sure to join them on their journey. Head over to WilliamWoodWatches.com, check them out on Instagram, check them out on YouTube. You can check all of their watches right there from the Jubilee to the Triumph to the Valium to the Bronze to the Chivalrous and they run competitions supporting firefighters charities all over the world including the firefighters charity in the UK. So once again thanks for coming back to the firefighters podcast. Go and check out William Wood Watches. Go and check us out on YouTube. Subscribe if you're listening on Spotify, if you're listening on one of those platforms, followers, raters, thanks for coming back and we look forward to seeing you again real soon right here on the Firefighters Podcast. Podcast.